note, I have no idea what to do right now. I'm kind of at a loss with it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and the YouTube videos are up to date. So the current, I think 29 went up yesterday. I think. Okay. Yep. Okay, so uh, good luck on APS 106. I know that that's tonight. Um, the other thing too is I, I am aware of the issue with I or OneNote and iPads and uh, Macs. I just don't know what to do with it. So that is an issue that unfortunately it only really works on Windows machines as far as I can tell. Uh, and uh, I, I'll try and do what I can. Uh, however, largely any of the discussion that I do is covered in the same lecture numbers in the uh, PDF files that are available. So if you look on my module, and uh, next year I'll probably spend a little time and reorganize those PDF files, uh, you'll find that uh, all of those correspond to the current lecture. So today's lecture 30, it will cover basically the same sort of thing as I will talk about. Uh, the figures will look different. Um, okay. I cannot win. I thought that would be a straightforward sort of thing to do. Okay, so like I said last time, we had, we've kind of gone beyond everything in terms of all of the rigid body topics except the last one, which is momentum. And you know at this point, so section 6C, we have dealt with particles. And when you deal with particles, they were okay. We did sort of a kludge and we kind of added in angular momentum by sort of looking at an odd sort of, uh, you know, odd case. We'd have uh, two trucks coming together at an intersection. The impact would occur and then we'd reference everything with respect to some point but we couldn't really do a linear and angular momentum at the same time. Rigid bodies, on the other hand, everything is together. And when I say everything is together, it means that you're sort of solving everything simultaneously, and you'll have a whole bunch of terms that appear and sort of stay the same. All right. And hopefully everything stays. Um, we have linear momentum, so basically just an arbitrary uh, shaped body. Again, the important thing in any body is just G, the center of mass. It'll have a velocity, it'll have an acceleration, and there are a whole bunch of forces acting on it. And we can refer to those forces a number of different ways, uh, particularly as a, uh, eventually as a sort of moment. There we go. Sorry, my screen went blank for a second. And unlike the previous part of the course, or previous sec uh, set of lectures, so uh, 27, 28, 29, uh, we have vectors. So we return to uh, vector problems, and we need to know the direction of everything. So sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration, and sum of forces over time. So we have sum of forces dt equals the integral t1 to t2 of m a g dt. And we end up with the same term as we had before, which is this force dt t1 t2 is equal to m b g as a function of time because mass is a constant at time two minus mvg at 
time one, and both of these being vectors. And those vectors allow me to write a linear momentum. So I have a linear momentum again. I have the exact same terms as I had before. I have linear impulse. And so I have a relationship that's going to start to look exactly as I had for particles. But of course, the big difference is that I'm looking at the center of mass in both of these cases. And so if you continue, you end up sort of oops, just having the same relationship you had before. Where, and I don't write this often, and I really, there's a reason because it starts to get a little bit too much, you can write them as linear impulse, which is G. And of course, G being the center of mass, that starts to make things very confusing. So if you have a linear imp or a momentum uh, at the beginning plus the impulse delivered, it's the final linear momentum of the system. So adding terms together uh, is pretty much the same as you did before, except now we're not going to look at the entire body. We're just going to be looking at the center of mass. Now, if there's no external resultant force, then momentum is conserved. And as a reminder, remember that in these cases, this is a force velocity time problem. So you're not looking at distances, you're looking at time. And you end up with mv1 equals mv2. And we work up making all of this more complex by adding some sort of splitting and separation of objects. And again, we will do a lot of examples looking at bullets sort of impacting a surface. Where this is different than the discussion with particle, uh, particle kinetics is that now we go back again to the same problem as before, which is I have a rigid body. It's made up of a whole bunch of mass elements. Those mass elements uh, each have some sort of velocity. And I can say The same thing. So the moment uh, about p, you end up with h sub p. If you do the derivation, if you remember the derivation back with particles, it's the exact same one, except now again, we're sort of separating it out a little bit. R dm with respect to p, some arbitrary point cross with the dm. Yeah. Now, 
with all of these derivations, I sort of say, hey, there's an arbitrary point P somewhere off in space and it doesn't matter. You never care about those. What you do care about is something that is sort of uh, G, so the center of mass. So in those cases, if P is G, then I G omega 1 plus the integral T1 T2 M G dt equals I G omega 2. And you can use that sort of relationship, it's conservation of angular momentum. So here again, just as you had above, the initial angular momentum of system plus the impulse delivered from moments is equal to the final angular or momentum of the system. And we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that there's no external moments applied to a system, and we end up with Ig1 equals Ig omega 2. And all of it, again, sort of dependent on your moment of inertia and writing out those terms. Um, So that leads to the main cases. Now, as a reminder, I really think it's kind of worthwhile. M A, and all we're doing here is M equals M dV dt. So you're rewriting this just in this form right here, and then spreading it apart. So that's why you know it's a force velocity distance or in this particular case moment velocity, moment angular velocity distance. So for a translational problem you'll have ooh, G which is equal to MVG and H of G which is equal to zero. So there's no rotation of the body, even if the body translates in a curvilinear path, that is, it travels along a curved path, as long as the body itself is not moving. It's not seeing any change. So G is equal to MVG, and H sub G is equal to zero. H sub G is not, or H sub arbitrary point, say A, for example, does not equal zero. And so that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So if, say, for example, I wanted to calculate a moment about another arbitrary point on the body, I will not have the benefit of this. So typically, I want to look at this. For fixed point rotation, I have an object, and I have pinned it at a point. And when I pin it at that point, I can look at either point G or point O or point A. But here we have moment mass times acceleration normal, mass times acceleration tangential. And if we sort of uh, do everything the way we should, we get HG and we get H naught is equal to I G omega plus RG MVG, which you can make a substitution for, and at this point you're very used to this, I naught omega. So you recognize at this point that that second last equation, this one right here, is equal to a parallel axis theorem. So you now have h sub g, h sub naught, two cases. Of course, the last case, and the one we can't do very much with, is just going to be g is equal to mvg, and hg 
is equal to ig omega. And so you end up with all of these terms sort of that you need to solve for any arbitrary sort of case. Um, okay. So if you're dealing with something like this, where you have a set of angular impulses that are delivered, M1, or single one in this case, you have a set of external linear impulses, F1, 2, and 3 over dt. You have an initial velocity, it should be capital G, I g omega 1. You have a final sort of velocity, and Vg2. In that case, you can use M V G1 plus the sum of T1 to T2 of Fx dt M V G1 or 2x M V G2 1 one y and And what you have there is linear impulse and momentum. And these are the type of problems you're going to solve. Typically, uh, to a large extent, we sort of do games so that we can avoid that middle term, but they can appear and you can sort of deal with them. They're not that bad. Typically, it's not that bad. Any questions on this? The only different thing from what we talked about way back in 3C and 4C, I guess, both of those are the same, is that now we're more worried about a single point on the body and recognizing that we have to translate all of the particles into one sort of uh, arbitrary point. It worked out fine for this. This doesn't really change. The only thing is IG, and you have to calculate that for each of the cases you're looking at. Uh. Okay, so I have a pipe section A, and it has a radius, which is R. And it has a mass M. And it's gently placed on the conveyor belt, which is moving with a velocity V sub naught. Friction between the belt and the pipe caused the pipe to move to the right and eventually roll without slip. How long does this take? And this is, this is a problem... I'm trying to remember, we had a bowling ball problem maybe two, three years ago, uh, 2022, I think, uh, where we did something similar. And again, it's the same sort of problem as that. Um, but you have going for you in this particular problem. You have a, a relatively simple sort of free body diagram. You only have the weight, and that has to be defined with respect to the center of mass. So G's right there. I have a normal force between the belt and uh, 
the pipe, and so I know that that's going to appear. And I have force of friction, which is applied to sort of deal with uh, motion. So, no, I don't want to do that. I already have a green pen. All right. So my linear impulse is where I start. And I can say mvgx1 plus t1 to t2 of f dt is equal to mvgx2. I also have So I also have angular impulse momentum because this thing is rotating. It's going to clearly rotate. Uh, and as it clearly rotates, I need to deal with that. So acting in the x direction is force of f, so I don't need to make this more complex than it needs to be. So I have the force of friction. I have uh, mvgx1, force of friction, and it's the only term acting in the x direction. I'm not worried about the y direction because nothing's happening in that direction. It's not bouncing. It's not doing anything exciting. Um, Okay, so here's my problem. I don't know what my moment of inertia is. My moment of inertia, when I'm looking at something like a pipe, is a hoop. Now, if I'm looking at a hoop, I know that that's the same thing as my radius of gyration. That's how I define my radius of gyration. So I can use that definition in order to sort of fill this in. And it's important that you recognize what the physical meaning of a radius of gyration is and the fact that we can use it for pipes. So make sure you're thinking about radius of gyration and not thinking about it as sort of this arbitrary function you use whenever you're given it. It really is just based on a hoop. So I have mr squared omega. I have all of the terms there. Um, and I can do the same thing for two. And I'll get from that mr squared omega 2 in the k direction. So I have the beginning and the end. The only difference is the angular velocity between the two. So at t equals 1, or at t1, vgx1 is equal to 0, and omega 1 is equal to 0. 
And I know it's zero because I've put this down gently on the belt. So I'm looking at it as I am dropping it slowly onto the belt. And as it's dropping on the belt, I'm just taking care to sort of make sure it stays there. So the only other thing that I need to know is what velocity of G2 is. And how do I define oh, good for me. Vg2 equals V naught minus R omega A2. And I know that's in the I direction. V naught is the belt velocity. And if I do the cross product, and again, one of the things that's nice about sort of, you know, just plopping out the, uh, the equation is you can sort of get right away to that point. But R is in the J direction, omega is in the K direction, you know you're going to end up with an I. When you do the cross product, you end up with a negative. The V of contact is no slip, but because the belt is moving, then it has the same velocity as the belt. So a uh, no slip means that if I roll something on the floor, the point of contact has the same velocity as the floor. In this case, the floor has a velocity, which is V naught. All right. And so I can sort of highlight that, rolling without slip. And that's the conveyor belt velocity. So from there, I have RC with respect to G cross with FI, which is force of friction, minus RJ. and crossed with Fi, which equals F, R, and K. So I know I have a three-dimensional problem. The moment has to act in the K direction. If I get a K, or if in this course, in this course only, in third year you probably do different things. But here, I know that I have to get something that's going to rotate about the z-axis. So R, integrated T1, T2 of F of F dt equals MR squared omega 2, because omega 1 is 0. And you know omega equals V divided by R, because it's no slip at the second position. And you end up with T1, T2 of F dt, which equals to M V naught minus um, da -da, R omega 2. Substituting in values, force of friction, you get mu K M G. Substitute terms in, mu k, mg are constant. If you do the integration, t2 minus t1 equals m v naught minus r omega 2. So what I'm assuming at this point is, and, and it's based on sort of what I was told, the pipe was dropped very slowly onto the belt. And so its initial momentum is zero. The only force acting on the belt is that friction. And that friction has to act over the entire time until I get to uh, rolling without slip. And when I have rolling without slip, I know what my velocity at the center is. 
because it'll be relative to the point of contact. The only difference here that makes this problem kind of interesting is that velocity at the center doesn't equal zero. I just want to see, oh, sorry, no, I forgot one thing. I got mu k mg times r, r squared, and the other one is mu k mg t2 minus t1 equals m v naught minus r omega 2. This is linear, and this is angular. Tunk, 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 tunk. I think we're all good there. Twice, whoops. So bringing them together, twice mu k g t2 minus t1 equals v naught minus mu k g T2 minus T1. Uh, no, sorry. Duck. And then twice mu k g T2 minus T1 equals V naught. And delta T is equal to V naught divided by twice mu k g. And there you go. What is kind of remarkable about this problem is this is a really complex kind of motion. I mean, think about it. You put a pipe down, zero velocity, and now you know how long it takes you to go there to a point where you are at the same, uh, at, at no slip on the belt, and that you've solved through for something of that nature. The important thing here is to recognize what the problem is. So as you're dealing with these problems, you're going to see a lot of problems with, you know, conservation of linear momentum and angular momentum. But this is kind of a useful sort of relationship to sort of keep in the back of your head. Questions? Um, and again, I mean, I kind of like it because it's not a it's not hard to sort of visualize, um, but it's actually quite remarkable that it works so well. So there you go. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Uh, so a typical problem, and one you've dealt with in the past, is one where you have a, a, a rod or some sort of pendulum that was impacted by a bullet and the up till now, the, the pendulum or the rod was zero mass. Well, now we're going to look at something that happens uh, when you have a plate which has a cross section of 0.45 meters by 0.45 meters. The bullet has a mass of 0.025 kilos. The velocity of bullet is 468.1 meters per second. I can put any number I want. Sometimes I do that just so I get a nice number at the end. Um, but if you do that, you have mass of plate of 9.1 kilos. You're asked to find omega of the plate immediately after impo uh, impact. And the reaction impulse at A is if bullet takes 0 0.0006 seconds for this to occur. So right away, you recognize that this is a time-based problem. And you have always kind of a force sort of implied with that. 
at the weights uh, and sort of the impact force. Um, and of course, velocity, and you want velocity, omega of the plate. So you're going to deal with uh, that. So if we look at this, we have mass of the bullet, V bullet, at time one, with respect to G, plus We have mg delta t, I'll include that here. But the external for or the, the external impulses are going to come from the weight and the reaction force at the pin. So ax delta t, ay delta t. And at the very end, you have mass of the plate V2 and I G omega 2. And again, for consistency, I have A. So I have the pinpoint, I have the center of mass, and I have the bullet. They've all sort of impacted against this. And I can start with mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet, times 0 0.35 meters. Because that's where it impacts. So it's causing a moment. So I take the linear uh, velocity or a linear or a momentum multiplied by the moment arm of 0.35 meters, and I get sort of that, plus zero. And that will equal mass of the bullet, or plate, V2, L over 2, plus I of the plate, omega 2. All right, so that's all there. Now, this is not one of those cases where you might be required to know this in advance, but the, this, the plate is 0.45 meters by 0.45 meters, uh, and for a square plate, it's going to be 1.6 mt. So in this, okay, so in this problem I know this, 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 I don't know anything else. So omega 2 is 5.33 rads per second, that is counterclockwise, and velocity 2 is equal to 1.2 meters per second. It's not there's not a lot to there. I'm ignoring the effect. I'm ignoring the effect of the bullet on the second part of the problem because the plate is 9.1 kilos and the bullet is 0 0.025. So that becomes a calculator error at that point. So 9.125. If I wanted to include that term, I would treat it as a hoop. And that would be R of the bullet squared. And if you look forward, you can see how that affects your calculation. And what we do with single particles that are sort of embedded in other particles is treat the mass 
And so that allows you, and you can add that in and see what the effect is on this particular calculation. So the second part of the problem, I have MB, VB plus AX delta T equals MT V2. AX is equal to minus 1300 newtons. So back in that direction. And for Y, I have zero oops, plus a y delta t equals zero. And I have zero because at both times this is not moving vertically. So at the beginning, it's just hanging there. Just after impact, it's still hanging there. It will move uh, immediately afterwards. But if this is during the time of impact, and it's over the delta T that I was given, and I end up with this minus 1,300 newtons. Now, what's also kind of interesting to do, and I kind of have been doing this when I do this on my own, is to sort of say, OK, does this make sense? And so V2 is like that, omega is like that. If I draw them out, I kind of convince myself that the directions make physical sense. Something impacted on the left-hand side, and I expect it to start moving towards the right, and as a consequence, to have the clockwise rotation. The AX, AY is a little bit harder to see, but AX is like that, and AY is zero, so there's no AY component. I probably could keep MG or something, but that might do nothing else. Uh, okay. I think. Now, this is. Is not a problem we did in a final exam, but it's very similar to a problem we did in a final exam, and it's one that is often very confusing, and I am not likely to sort of finish it today. So I'm just starting it right now. And again, it would be 2022, 2023, 2022, 2023, maybe 2021. So if you kind of, you'll see similar types of problems. This is it actually was one where it fell into a corner. Okay. And the question was in final exam, which way was it rotating? Which was it was kind of a okay, I'll say it's clever, you may not agree with me because I'm sure I'll hear from you. I have a uniform slender rod, mass of 2.3 kilos, and the length L of 0.75 meter, which forms an angle theta equals 30 degrees with the vertical. And as it strikes the smooth corner shown with a vertical velocity, V1 of 2.5 meters per square second and no angular velocity. Determine the angular velocity immediately after impact. Uh, all right, so I kind of have put some helpful things for me. Uh, I know this is an angular momentum problem because I have a moment that's going to be caused by this weight as it rotates down. I've got a velocity and I've got a time. And I also know that this is a uh, long slender rod, and so that's a typical case where I'm going to have enough, 1 12th ml squared. And that value is going to be given as 0 .0, 0 0.107 to the square root of meter. Don't we have to consider like the, the actual like collision with the coordinates? I haven't done anything yet. This is just the beginning. And I'm saying, are we going to? Oh, no. Well, again, as you're dealing with these things, you look at a problem like this, 
this and you say, all I'm looking at is the state. Don't make it more complex than it is. There's often a tendency to look at these problems and assume we're going to ask you something crazy. We don't. Focus on the actual problem. And the problem is solve for what's happening with this orange stuff. So before impact, I have a velocity action down. After impact, I have the reaction forces at the corner, and I have, I didn't really include the weight. It's not going to do anything. Um, and then after impact, which is the more interesting part, I'm going to have an angular velocity and a linear velocity associated. So, Again, when you're solving these problems, make sure that you look and draw everything out. Don't look for more than there is. Don't look at the whole system. The, the corner is right here. That's the reaction force of the corner at the, uh, at after impact. So before impact, I have m v1 l of the rod divided by 2 sine There are none. External moments, there are none. I can leave it at zero because I'm going to assume that it occurs over a very short time. And so what I really need to know is what's the angular velocity after impact. So when it started, Because at that point, V2 is normal to point A. So it doesn't have the sine beta. So what is a very complex sort of occurrence, I mean, again, when you look at this type of problem, it's, it's often very challenging to, to really visualize what's happening. It becomes just initial angular momentum equals final angular momentum. And the only difference is it's been brought to rest. If you substitute in all the terms, you get mv1 L over 2 sine Theta all over I G plus M L squared over four, and you end up and right on time, two point five rads per second. Just one second. So taking into consideration the impact, taking into consideration everything that happened. A very complex motion becomes straightforward. Go ahead. Are you telling me when you compare that collision between the two things? Like in this case, it's like an inelastic collision, right? We haven't talked about elastic or plastic uh, collisions, and they're not covered in the course officially. But in one of your lucky day on Monday, I should be able to cover a little bit about them. So I will be looking at a problem yeah. since I have time. We are, okay? We, in, we consider elastic and plastic. We do not consider partially elastic collisions. And so because we don't do that, we just tell you what happens at the end. So the impact occurs, and in this case, it's just stuck in there and it starts to rotate. 
so you have to think about it that way.